We've heard a lot of rhetoric about the high demands of Common Core and how it will require some changes. So clearly they want rigor in the curriculum. But it can be actually quite difficult when looking at our curriculum to decide whether it's up to the full range of the rigor. In the past, a lot of curriculum alignment has been more uh, in order of does this particular task correspond or relate to a particular standard? But now we need to take a look at entire lesson sequences and look at how ideas are developed to explore whether it covers the full depth and intent of the curriculum. Uh, of the uh, Common Core Standards. So that's what we're going to take a look at in this presentation as it pertains to the domain that we've been studying, counting and cardinality. So what should we be looking for? Well, we definitely need to include the standards of mathematical practice. The Common Core authors have been extremely clear that that list should not be ignored, but should be merged with the content. The students should, should learn the content through the standards of mathematical practice. And when I was at the National uh, Convention for the National Council of Teachers in Mathematics this last spring, one of the presenters who sits on the board of the two assessment um, consortium, she says that the tests will all, every item, will incorporate a standard of mathematical practice. All of the content will be assessed via uh, and only via the standards of mathematical practice. So we need to take those very seriously. We definitely need to look for evidence of those in the curriculum. Also learning progressions. The Common Core authors have a document series, a series of documents available at www.commoncoretools.wordpress.com and those progressions uh, provide a lot of background information about the Common Core State Standards and I've used those quite a bit as we go through this uh, module to help frame the kinds of things we're thinking about and talking about. So we'll revisit those uh, progressions related to counting and cardinality to make sure that there's evidence that those are being fully developed in your curriculum. And then also developmental learning sequences. It isn't just did we cover something, but it's did we get the students there. And in order to get the students there, we actually have to plan out scaffolded sequences of instruction that take students from where they are to this much higher, much more in-depth level of where they need to be. So the Common Core authors have said rigor is essential, and they define that rigor um, as being three-pronged. So rigor is having a deep conceptual understanding. Math makes sense. The underlying mathematical relationships and concepts are completely evident and able to be leveraged in, in providing guidelines, instructions, rationales, explanations for why my strategy worked. And procedural skill and fluency is also important. So unlike the math wars in the past that put conceptual understanding on one side and procedural skill and fluency on the other, the Common Core authors have clearly come out saying it's both and. Both of these are important. And also applications, that students are actually putting these applications, uh, putting these ideas, concepts, and procedures to work to solve real problems and to engage with um, deep investigations. So there's some applications as well. The Common Core authors said these are not to be done in isolation. A lot of times they can be done together. It's possible to um, build conceptual understanding through an application and to build procedural skill through a conceptual sequence. So these are things that we need to try to look for, opportunities for them to be merged, developed simultaneously, and the mathematical practice standards should be merged in there as well. The publisher's criteria is a document that the Common Core writing team have published to help clarify exactly what we should be looking for in curriculum. And so they're indicating again, as I've stated already, that students' conceptual understanding of key mathematical concepts should be developed and the curriculum should be supportive to teachers in doing that. That there should also be attention to procedural skill and fluency. We've talked about that. Sufficient time working with applications as long as that the work with those applications doesn't become a major detraction from the focus of the content for the grade level. And also content and practice must be taught simultaneously, learning content through practice standards.
Okay, let's take a look. These are the progressions that relate to the counting and cardinality domain, and we've talked about all of these, uh, from saying the counting words to actually counting out objects, from subitizing, being able to see things at a glance, to single-digit arithmetic fluency, and that's initially being able to see things at a glance, then being able to see more than one group at a glance, and then merging those groups in your mind using a mathematical relationship. That's how it gets to single-digit arithmetic fluency. From counting, rote counting for example, and counting by ones, to counting on. And from spoken number words to the written base 10 numerals, understanding that relationship, but also how our number system and the way we write numerals is embedded with base 10 meaning as well. Okay, so we're going to take each of those progressions, take a look at them individually. I'm going to go through this kind of fast because I've embedded these in the notes as well, so you can look at them more on your own time, and I won't go through every bullet point here. But essentially, from saying the counting words to counting out objects has embedded conceptual understandings that have to be developed and leveraged. It has procedural skills that have to be developed and, and leveraged to be able to do this. And there are all kinds of applications. As you take a look at this, these elements should all be present in your curriculum. There should be efforts to help students grapple with ideas of cardinality and nested numbers, opportunities for them to build the one-to-one -one correspondence, and do you see any images that foster subitizing, these known patterns that are easy to see, or are the things that they're counting all kind of randomly distributed? distributed on a, in, in an image. So do you see things that look like common dot patterns they could recognize at a glance or tin frames where they could get to know quantities at a glance? Applications need to include both movable and non-movable items. The non-movable items need to have a variety of sequenced um, arrangements including from linear to rectangular to circular to, to um, more scrambled. So there needs to be a variety and then gradually increasing amounts as well. You can incorporate the mathematical standards, practice standards as well, by creating a counting culture in your classroom that involves double checking to make sure we're right and sometimes triple checking if our first two counts don't match. So we can get them attending to precisions. Uh, to precision, we can have them using a whole variety of tools to help count and keep track of our count. And then they can make decisions about which tools lend themselves to this particular task so they can learn to use appropriate tools strategically. And we can give them counting problems, things to count, that have a lot of embedded complexity that they will have to try to make sense of what to do, make some decisions about it, and persevere to get the job done. So that can include some fairly large um, sizes of objects where they may have to organize them in groups of 10 for example or it can include things that are in packages where they can't open the package and count by ones so they have to learn to count on so through those experiences you can get some uh, making sense and perseverance in the act of solving a problem so as you look at your curriculum uh, the number word list should always be way ahead of the counting quantity. So at any given point in the year when you examine a counting experience, think about whether the, the rote number word list is way ahead of what they're actually having to count in the name of obj number of objects. That the sizes of sets and the arrangements gradually go in complexity instead of starting with, let's say, a scrambled view of something and that the counting of existing sets that we provide the students precedes asking them to create sets. So when you look at a sequence, a learning sequence, are they asked to actually count existing sets before they're asked to create their own? Because that would be more developmentally appropriate. And then do you see a lot of opportunity for students to make connections between the spoken number words, the way the numerals are written, and the quantity and bringing all three of those, the number triad, into um, a connection. One little proviso before we move on, we're looking for a variety of ways to represent visually the kind of counting that students are doing. And number lines are pretty frequent. I see them in most classrooms that I go into, but regrettably I often see number lines in the early childhood classroom that are inappropriate. So I've included an example. The number line that you see in the top left page is points on a line. This model is not appropriate before second grade, and that's not just my opinion. You can read a number of documents about the research. Very young children do not understand this kind of number line because there is 
what's between the one and the two. You and I know that the, the distance that says one just marks the end of the bar that means one. That the entire distance from zero to the line that says one, that distance is one, not the point one. But this is not something that young children understand. And so the points on a line model um, well documented in research has trouble with young children. So kindergarten and first graders should be using a number path, which you see on the bottom left. That's just one example. Um, but that's a number path where it's clear what one means, and it's clear that two means two blocks. You don't have to wonder about spaces in between. So that's something that you should consider. Uh, and I find these harder to find. You have to look for number paths. If you want to go to a teacher store and buy number lines for your children's table, you'll probably find all of the points on a line and none of the number paths, but you need to look around or create your own so that that's what children have. From subitizing to single digit arithmetic, we're looking for a curriculum that shows these and takes advantage of these known dot patterns, tens frames, things that students can see at a glance and begin to combine values. A lot of curriculum do not have enough of these if any. So the number talks that we discussed earlier would be a great example of something you could use to foster subitizing. And then through the mathematical practice standards, you're actually looking for structure. You're looking for a known pattern that you can use and take advantage of. So looking for and making use of structures is a great thing. Different students might look at the same image and they might see the pattern differently. So you also get into Mathematical Standard of Practice 3 where different people can describe how they personally saw it and how they used that and how they were able to figure out by recomposing those groups. So again, looking at your curriculum to determine whether it's taking advantage of these familiar patterns and using it to foster subitizing. Um, but the text is not everything. A lot of this will actually happen through your dialogue, your number talks. It's your implemented curriculum rather than what's on paper in the text that can elicit this. So think about how you can take advantage of that. One way to find out whether your curriculum is doing a good job with this is whether the majority of your students are actively looking for patterns they can see and drawing them to your attention and explaining, I saw it this way. Um, if, you see, if you have the majority of your students who are engaging with counting in that way, then maybe your curriculum is already doing a good job with this particular progression. Here's an example from a text uh, where the first image is a familiar pattern. They can subitize six. The second one is not exact, but if they have just done the first one where they thought, saw six, they might be able to see the six here too. The six is sideways and there's two dots stuck in the middle. Um, so if they see it that way, then they might know, oh, well, that's the six, but then there's two more, so seven, eight. Um, so that's an example of how in a kindergarten curriculum you can do a subitizing to arithmetic strategy progression. Notice that this one example does not address the progression. Students need to have enough experience with this that it becomes part of the way they think before you can say that they have grasped this progression. Next progression from counting objects to counting on. So really moving from counting by ones to being able to count on. And counting on in actual counting tasks is a first grade mastery expectation, but you will see some kindergarten students able to do that. However, what we talked about in this PD module is that before anybody can do that, they have to be able to do a forward counting sequence starting from a number other than one. And that is a kindergarten mastery standard that directly relates to this progression. So being able to uh, do forward counting on from a number other than one is going to be really critical. And then, of course, you can um, model how to apply that in counting situations and see whether some of the students are able to go ahead and apply that. And uh, also you can embed the mathematical standards of practice in this particular progression as well. Some students may notice, for example, especially if you've been using a number path to model what students are telling you for strategies, that whenever you count on by one, you're just at the next number. It's like saying the next number in the number word list. Now that seems obvious to you and me, but that's actually always true. Whenever you count on by one, it will always be the number, next number in the number word list. That's an aha that takes advantage of an expressed regularity. This always works this way, and this is how our number system works. So that's just an example of um, what you can 
do. You can also help them see that if you have a fairly large number and you only have to count two more, that it's very advantageous to start with that big number and count on two more. They can begin to see, though, that if you have a lot to count on, like if I have a group of, of 12 and I have two extra items, much easier to count on from 12 13, 14, then to count on from 2 um, the 12 more times. That would be much more difficult. So that's another example of looking for and making use of structure as they make decisions. Here's some images from curriculum that foster a counting on idea by helping to implant a known group in children's mind. So um, in the first, these are from different pages, but you'll see that part of the group is provided. And then notice the, the scaffolding being removed here. So at the top, we have everything. They could count by ones. But the next time, it's sort of you know kind of faded away, but they can still see it. So they could count. And towards the end, they have to add it on to themselves. So these are some ideas that begin to focus on that transition. The next item in the middle, students can choose to start at one of these numbers. So for example, starting at 4 and then moving forward from that point, which is what it looks like that child um, whose work I'm looking at has done. And then in the last column, you see again a known group. Children who need to count by ones can still do it, but in a strategy share, some people might just say, well, I just knew that was 8 already. So I went um, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So they can do, um, they can just count forward like that. So some students will start doing it, but there's still that one by one in case uh, some students need that. From spoken number words to written base 10 numerals to base 10 understanding, we're getting at can students look at a teen number, for example, and see how the way we write teen numbers already tells us that there's 110 and it tells us the number of leftovers. That is a huge aha for kindergarten. So there's some conceptual understanding that has to happen there, as well as being aware already of the number word list, uh, already knowing the sequence of numbers in the teens and being able to say that rote, being able to write numerals accurately as well, or some procedural skills there. And then in application settings, you can use this all the time in counting collections because you can organize your collection according to a 10 and a leftover and use that to help you count. Some mathematical standards of practice, um, clearly the way our number system works is based on this pattern in our number system. And so we can explore that pattern through models so we can get into some of uh, mathematical standard practice for where we're modeling these things and we're making connections between the models we can use tools that help us like for example towers of 10 and leftover um, units and we can also explore that connection between the way we write our number system and the uh, what it means as far as numbers of groups so in other words looking at the pattern of the way our number system works which would be mathematical standard practice eight here are a couple of images from text where students are taking advantage of it in the description or in the image that you see off to the upper right, the student has to identify the group of 10 and the leftovers. They have to see it in the image. And again, here you go to some subitizing. You can see these two rows of five look like a 10 frame in the middle. And so this child has obviously noticed that and began to think I have one 10 and I have a five. And then later on, being able to think of a tower of 10 as one 10 and eight ones, writing it as one ten and eight ones, but also thinking of it as 18. That takes some, uh, inst I've only cut out some and shown you some images, but some instructional uh, investigation has to occur there for that aha. The images in this lesson, unless otherwise noted, came from early bird kindergarten mathematics. Their images tend to be very intentional about the kind of math that they want children to learn, so I used images from there. And the publisher's criteria is well worth